for joining us for the Thursday training call. We're going to begin in just a second here, but I'm going to give you guys a minute just to uh, go ahead and uh, type in any questions you might have so I can make sure those get addressed for you. Uh, if you're new to this call, the way you type in questions is inside your GoToMeeting toolbar. Uh, if it's collapsed, there should be a little orange arrow in the top right corner of your screen. Uh, when you click on that guy, it should open up the GoToMeeting panel for you, and there's an area in there called Questions. And you can go ahead and type in what you'd like to see or what you need help on, and we will certainly address that for you. So while you guys are doing that, uh, just kind of give you a brief overview, some, some reminders on uh, where to find assets and some of the new things that have come out lately. Uh, one of them is if you have not yet downloaded the RateWatch mobile app, make sure you've got that. Uh, it's available for Android and iOS. And in order to do that, all you have to do is go to your app store. Uh, if you're on an iPhone, just you know, hit the little app store icon. If you're on a Google device, uh, you're going to hit the Google Play Store. And then type in RateWatch in your search and then you'll see RateWatch will come up there and you can go ahead and install that. It is a free app. Uh, if, you're on, if you're on an Android device and you've not yet set up a Google Play account, it will ask you for a credit card to tie to your account so that you can purchase apps in the future. However, I will tell you that this app is completely free so there will be no charges associated with downloading it. So don't worry about it. Go ahead and set yourself up with a Google account just in case you want to download other apps. All right, so with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get into uh, just kind of a uh, probably one of the most common comparisons I'm seeing coming across my desk lately, and that's going to be the low down payment options. So I'm going to just kind of build this from scratch with you, and if you'd like to see any additional details shown on here, just shoot me a quick message over in the questions area, and I'll make sure that gets in there. So for this one, I'm going to change it over to marketing. And for those of you who have never played with this little toggle here, what it does is if you have it on individual, it will show the client's uh, first and last name, it's going to show the property address, and it's really meant to go directly to your client. However, if you want this report to be shared, if you want it to, if you want to put it out in social media, you probably want to make it a marketing report because when you make it a marketing report, what it does is it actually replaces the first and last name with the report headline. And then it also hides the property address. So when you, when you put those in, uh, they won't show up on the report at all. So you can feel free to distribute this as needed. And it looks like uh, Chris has a question. Um, I would like to know how to get my escrows, prepaids, aggregate adjustments to match Calix Point. We have split uneven taxes in our market. So Chris, I might actually have to see what one of your fee worksheets looks like in order to be able to help you on that one. Um, without having the actual detail to input, I'm not sure I can get it exactly right for you. But generally what I end up doing with these when they come across the support desk is I'll ask you for a fee worksheet and then I'll match it in there for you. Now, especially when it comes to split taxes and aggregate adjustments. Really, an aggregate adjustment, you're only going to find that inside Calix there. So you'll actually have to copy that adjustment into uh, the fee detail. But I'll show you that when we get over to the fee detail screen, how to create a custom item so that you can uh, get that taken care of. And then I'll also show you how to do the uh, escrows and prepaids as well. All right, so for our report headline, uh, we're going to go ahead and just make it something like uh, low down payment options. All right, and then uh, for, for the other items, you know, this one's a marketing report, so there's a lot of contact information that we're not necessarily going to collect here. Um, it's, you know, the, the only real most important things in the presentation are the parts in red uh, in order to be able to save the presentation, in order to be able to show uh, uh, certain options about the loan. So parts in black, while they're not required, are certainly helpful. So I'll go through those as, as we continue on here. Now, this is a... Uh, you know, you can make it a client or a prospect. In, a, as in the case of a marketing report, I would probably make it a prospect because it's not actually one of your clients yet. And then the question, do they own or rent? Um, this one actually, there's, there's two functions to this. If you choose rent, it's going to guide you through a rent versus own presentation. But it also eliminates the need for a current mortgage. Um, I will tell you, however, if you choose own, there is another toggle that you can use to get rid of current mortgages to do a purchase. So what I usually recommend is if you are if you're anticipating having to do a rent versus own presentation, you want to check rent. If you're not, even if they are renting and you're not going to do a rent versus own, leave it on own, and I'll show you how to get around that in just a second here. Now, partner email, this becomes really important, especially if you're doing a, kind of a co-marketing type of thing with one of your realtor partners. When you put uh, your, your partner's email address in this field, you'll see that an option opens up at the very end of the presentation that allows you to copy your partner on all the alerts that you get. So when you get an alert when somebody views your presentation, your partner will also get that alert. So I'll put uh, just partner, partner.com. 
Now, the friendly name, this actually is a nickname for your presentation. So if you're not, uh, if, if you're just getting started with Edge, uh, friendly name is not a nickname for your borrower. It's not, uh, this guy goes by John. It's, uh, it's what this report is about so that you can identify it when you're searching for it in your, uh, in your database records here. So in this case, my friendly name, not terribly important because it's a marketing report. I don't really have any specifics on this, but I might put it in something like the property address that I'm focusing on. So 123 Any Street. And then I'm going to hit the right arrow. Now, the right and left arrows inside Edge are your save points. These are, these are what actually saves the data. You notice there's no save buttons anywhere in here, so it saves between the screens for you. Now, my next step, remember I told you, if you select Own and you don't choose a purchase goal, it's going to ask you to do a refinance. But we don't want to do a refinance in this situation. We want to show different purchase options. So in order to do that, we're going to check the goal that says Purchase a New Home. This eliminates the need for a current mortgage. We won't even ask you about it. Now the next step, there's only one field in red here. That's the one you want to be focused on. And that is going to be your purchase price. So let's say this is a $200,000 house. And I'm going to leave the rest of it completely open. Now if we were doing a refinance strategy, we'd be asked about more current mortgage details to actually you know, isolate what that payment is and to build an amortization for it. But in this case, because we're doing a purchase, we don't need to do anything with these other fields. Now we get into the affordability section, which these are very personalized questions for your borrower. Um, I would tell you that in, a, in the case of a marketing presentation like I'm doing here, I would probably end up leaving all of this blank. There's, there's really no reason to do this unless you want to specify a tax benefit. Now if you're target marketing a specific group of borrowers and you see that I'm at the, the $200,000 range here, uh, you can kind of guess at what kind of tax brackets your, your target borrowers are going to be at. Um, I would say in a case like this, you're probably going to be at about the 25% tax bracket, but you can find out by hitting Find Tax Bracket, and this will actually open up a page that uh, it's really easy to figure out. You've just got a grid here that shows you what the income ranges are, and if I'm looking at a $200,000 house, generally my income range, I'm probably looking at thirty-seven to about $90,000, so 25% is probably a fair guess on this one. Now, if you do put a tax bracket percentage in here, it is going to show you the tax benefit on your presentation going through. If you don't want to show tax benefit, which is completely up to you, you certainly don't have to, if you don't want to show tax benefit, just leave the tax bracket field blank here. I'm going to go ahead and put it in, because I want you to see what it looks like on the output report. And then I'm going to continue on. Now, at this point, these are more questions that you would have to an individual borrower, so we're not going to need to enter anything here. We're just going to go ahead and move forward. And this lands us in the products. So now we have to decide what kind of products do we want to show for this person. Now for low down payment options, you guys can probably already guess there's a, there's a, few, uh, there's, there's a few loan products that come to mind. One is obviously going to be your FHA 3.5% down. So let's do that one first. And once you've got the name in there, you notice it's, it's defaulting to no, it's not a refi. You want to leave that as no. As current mortgage checkbox, it actually causes confusion for people. Um, you should never actually have to check this box. This box actually will only get checked if you're copying a current mortgage in the case of doing a resubordination. But I would tell you that most of your products, when you're showing them in the products area, these are all going to be new mortgages. So you can think of this checkbox as, is this a new mortgage or is it an existing mortgage? If you check it, you're saying it's an existing mortgage that's already, that's already been taken out a while back. So we want to leave this one unchecked. And add product from template. If you have developed product templates, you can certainly use one of your product templates in here. You can see I've got a ton of them in here, and I've got them separated by what kind of uh, products they are. Uh, specifically when you're doing ARMS, it's a really good idea to have product templates because you can have all the caps and adjustments pre-filled for you. Um, but for today's case, I'm going to build it from scratch. So most importantly, when you're doing a government loan, make sure that this question, is this a VA FHA program, you want to toggle that over to yes. Now, there's, there's one other variable there. You would also use this for a USDA program. So uh, you want to check that for yes. And what that does is it opens up a new field in the next screen that's going to allow you to collect the upfront MIP or the funding fee or the guarantee fee, depending on what type of government loan you're doing. Now, you notice that I jumped between the down payment selection as a, as a dollar amount and as a percentage by simply hitting this button here. That's what allows you to toggle back and forth. So I'm going to put in my 3.5% down. 
and then I'll put the rate that I can get right now, say four and a half, on a 30-year term. Now, if you're doing your first presentations right now, this is one of the gotchas. Uh, don't put 30 here. If you put 30 here, you're going to have a really high payment. So make sure you always enter these in the form of months. Now, my next step is to include my, my fees and costs. So this kind of gets back to Chris's question earlier. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we need to account for the upfront MIP. So I'm going to hit that percentage button. I'm going to put in my 1.75%. And then I'm going to check the box to add this to the loan amount. This automatically increases your amount financed by the amount of the upfront MIP. And you'll see that right now we're showing a, an LTV of 96.5. Once this upfront MIP gets rolled in, it's going to be 98.1. So you'll see that adjust when we get to the next screen here. But remember, these arrows are your save buttons. So Edge doesn't yet know that this is really in there until you advance the screen. And the next step goes into the closing costs. Now, in the closing costs, I would encourage all of you to develop your fee templates. And, and the reason I say this is because you don't know and have to line item everything every single time. Now, there's two ways to do closing costs. You can do them as ballpark fees, and that would be simply just typing in your 2500 for APR fees. You're just basically making estimates at what all of these fees would be. And that's acceptable, too. Remember, most of the time you're using this, it is going to be pre-GFE, and you can continue adjusting it going forward the link that you're sending your client will actually always show what's inside of Edge. So if you choose to make adjustments down the line, say for instance a rate change, they didn't lock in time, you can always come back in here and make your changes and that link that you sent them will show the updated version. So you don't have to resend it. You can just tell them, hey, I've updated it. Click on that link again. Or maybe you put a new video on it um, and you, know, you tell them about the updates and tell them to click the link again. They'll get the new video and new data. Now that's one way to do it. And Again, completely up to you in terms of how detailed you want to get on this, uh, but I'm going to show you the detail version, and that is going into the closing cost detail. Now, if you do have fee templates already built, you can select them here from the dropdown. I'm going to build one out for you from scratch. Now, th this is where actually, Chris, earlier I referred to using your fee worksheet. When, you, uh, when you're first starting to build your templates, you want to get a couple of fee worksheets together, one for an FHA, you know, your most common loan products, uh, one for a conventional 30, uh, if you have different fees on a conventional 15, uh, any special programs you have, you want to build out those fee templates. Now, you can build them out by state, so if you, you're originating in multiple states, and usually they do have different fees per state, uh, you can separate these fees by state so that when you select a particular state, only the templates that apply to that state will be available for you. For today, I'm just going to simply add a bunch of fees, and you can see I just kept hitting the Add Fee button there. And then I'm going to use this drop-down selector to select which fees I want. Now, the quickest way to get through this list, and you can see it's, it's a growing list. We keep adding to it continually. Um, the quickest way is simply type the letter, the first letter of the uh, type of fee that you want. So for instance, if I wanted to do an appraisal here, I'm going to type A, and I can keep typing A until I get down to where it says Appraisal Fee and then I can put in the amount that it's going to cost. And then I'm going to do credit, so I'll type C, and keep typing C until I get down to credit report. And then for the next one, maybe there's an underwriting fee, so I'll type a U. Normally that would probably only be on a refi, but that's okay. Uh, and then if you've got any other fees that you want to include, things like doc fees, there's my uh, doc prep, maybe I've got recording, and then, uh, let's see, what else? We've got title fees, so we're going to have owner's title. We'll have lender's title. Now, your, your escrows, your, your prepaid escrows, those actually you're going to enter in the next screen. So we don't need to worry about doing this, adding a hazard insurance reserves or tax reserves. Uh, we're going to do that in the next screen, and I'll show you how to do that. But for now, I'm going to fill out the, uh, the dollar amounts for these. And the title insurance, you guys know this is going to change usually on a case-by-case -case basis for you and also change depending on what title company you've chosen to use. Uh, if you just specifically use one title company, you can actually get away with using percentages for these. Uh, if you know the percentage that, that it's going to cost, um, generally it's going to be a very low percentage, like something like 0.04, something like that. And you can see Mine is probably a little bit, uh, I probably need to go a little bit higher on this one, but uh, you, the, the easy way to figure this out is have your fee worksheet in front of you and start, start using percentages until you get a dollar amount that matches what you're looking for. And generally you can use that, that percentage going forward. 
Now, lender's title, um, we'll do as a dollar amount. Let's say that's 250 or something. Now, the next step is to choose who's paying these fees. And generally, your borrower is going to pay most of them, but your seller might end up paying for one of the uh, title insurance fees. So if that's the case, if you've got your seller paying the owner's title, you want to hit seller here. And you can see that once you do that, you're going to see that the seller paid items here reflect how much the seller is paying. So the borrower is no longer responsible for that $80 fee. The next step is determining which ones are APR fees. Now, if you, uh, if you don't know which fees generally apply to the APR, you can always shoot us a note over in support. Or you can hit help up here. And when you hit help, this is actually going to open up our, our knowledge base. And if you type APR into the search, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring up an article that shows you exactly which fees applies to the APR, which ones don't, and which ones you probably have to ask about, because there's a couple that are different between different lenders. But generally, let's say I've got my, uh, my underwriting fee, um, my doc prep. Those are generally going to be my only APR fees. Uh, the prepaid escrows, those ones we're going to do in the next screen, so I'll show you that in just a moment. But Chris had asked about things like aggregate adjustments. Now, we don't have a, a line item called aggregate adjustment, I don't believe. Let's see. Oh, we do. Okay, I've got one in mind, actually. I think I created this at some point in the past. Um, but if you don't have one in your list, you can add a custom fee. So you hit add custom fee, call it aggregate adjustment. And then you're going to hit OK. And then you would enter the amount here. Now, if, it, uh, if it's a negative amount, you can do that as well. Usually your aggregate adjustment is going to be positive. But um, if you do have a fee that you'd like to actually reduce the fees, you can put it in as a negative amount, and it will have the effect you're looking for. Now, what if I want to enter a contribution? So I'm going to get rid of this aggregate adjustment here. And I'm going to add another fee. What I'm going to do is when I hit this drop down, I'm going to type C until I get to one called contribution. This is one that we've built in there for you. Now, the reason I, I tell you to choose this method is because this fee actually has logic behind it. It knows that whatever dollar amount you put here, it's going to reduce your cash to close by that dollar amount. Now, if you simply add a custom fee and call it seller contribution, and you make it a positive amount, it's just going to look like a positive fee that the borrower is responsible for. So it's not going to work the way you expect. But I'll show you how to do that in just a moment here. Let's say that there is a $500 lender contribution. This is the easiest way to represent it. The other way to represent it would be to add a custom fee, call it lender contribution. Now, one thing to remember, when you add a custom fee, you only have to add it once, and it'll be in your drop-down list from there on out. If you've added the same fee over and over and over again, I'll show you where you can go in the settings to delete some of those, uh, those duplicates, because your list is going to get really long doing that. Now, if I'm going to do it as a lender contribution, meaning a custom fee here, rather than using the contribution line item, I need to do this as a negative amount and I'm going to leave it as borrower paid. So this is technically the borrower is not responsible for $500. This will do the exact same thing as the one above it. All right, so I'm only going to use one of them. Now, when you're, when you're done inputting your fee structure, you want to save this as a template so you don't have to do it every time. So you're going to hit Save as Template, and I'm going to call this one FHA 30 fees or something like that, and then I'm going to hit OK. Now, the good news is anytime I come into any of my fee details for any presentation inside Edge, whether it be a client or a partner presentation, I will now have this FHA 30 fee structure available in this dropdown. And you can see that's at the very bottom of my list. Uh, but when I select this, it's going to pull in these line items just as I've left them here. Now, you'll find that if you, if you can't narrow down an exact percentage on your title fees, you might end up leaving these blank in your template uh, so that you can fill them in on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, once you're done with your fees, you've saved it as a template, you're going to hit Apply to Loan. And you'll see that it's now grayed out areas that uh, are actually summaries of what's inside the closing cost detail. So if you wanted to be able to edit these line items, you would go back into the detail and edit the specific items, and it'll update the totals here for you. I'm going to put in my 15 days of prepaid interest. And if you ever want to know what that equates to, simply hover your mouse over it. It'll show you exactly what that dollar amount is. Uh, it'll also appear on your outbound presentation. Now, next step is going to be to do my monthly costs. So I like to do these as percentages. 
Now, if you do know exact dollar figures, say in the case of a refinance, you can certainly enter the dollar figures in here rather than the percentages. Uh, when it comes to purchases, it, you may not know this information just yet, so I usually recommend using those percentages. And they can be different in each state, and in fact, even within the state, there's different, uh, like if you go to Northern California, there's certainly a different hazard insurance percentage than there is in Southern California. Now, next step, I need to account for my mortgage insurance. Now, on FHA loans, especially a high LTV FHA loan like this one, I know that my factor is going to be 1.35. And probably the most important thing about government loans is when you're showing MI or you're showing a, a monthly fee like on the USDA, uh, you make sure to check this box. Calculate the MI based on the balance. This recalculates the mortgage insurance payment every year based on the average 12 months balance. Now, conventional MI doesn't do this. Only government MI does this. Now, finally, we need to make sure that this mortgage insurance lasts for the life of the loan. If I leave just a 78% cutoff, it's going to stop at 78%, roughly 120, 130 months in. We don't want that to happen. Instead, we're going to tell it the minimum month that the MI needs to carry. This MI cutoff month is asking you for the minimum. So in the past, remember FHA used to require five years minimum, and then if it hit 78, you could drop it. So if it was one of those loans, I would put 60 here. That would be my five-year minimum. However, FHA guidelines have changed. You have to carry it for the life of the loan now. So in this case, I'm going to put a 360. Now what this means is that this 78%, completely inconsequential, doesn't matter at all. Um, it's simply just going to carry the mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. But because of this Calc MI on balance, this mortgage insurance payment is going to decline over time. And I'll show you that when we get to the live presentation because this is something that's very powerful for borrowers to realize. There's this huge stigma around FHA loans that say, oh my God, mortgage insurance for the life of the loan, I can't afford that. What they don't realize is that at the end of the loan, that mortgage insurance payment is like 14 bucks. It's, it's not what they expect. So in the interest of educating, I would always recommend you show a payment stream for, uh, for your FHA loans. Now let's get into the reserves. Now reserves, you can enter them in the form of months here. And what EDGE does is it takes the, whatever number you enter here, multiplies it by the hazard insurance monthly, and then adds a new fee line item back in your detail. So let's say I want to collect three months of hazard insurance reserves, and I want two months of tax reserves, and then I want to collect the annual premium, hazard insurance premium here for 12 months. Now when I hit my left or right arrow, it's going to save. I'm going to go left because I want to show you what it did inside the detail. So now when we go into our closing cost detail, if we scroll to the bottom, you'll see that there's three new line items that Edge added for us. The hazard insurance reserves, the taxes reserves, and the hazard insurance premium for the year. Those are grayed out because they're being populated by what we did in that screen we were just looking at. Now you can certainly delete these if you want to. It's actually just going to clear those check boxes out for you. But I would advise if you're going to change these in any way, you want to do it from, from that other screen that we were just on. And that would be right here. So for instance, if I don't want to collect that premium, I would simply uncheck this box, and it's going to remove that line item from my uh, closing cost detail. So now, if you've never saved product templates, you probably want to save this as a template. Now, the difference between a product template and a fee template is that the fee template is simply the itemized fees. The product template has everything in all three of these screens. So your fees, it has all the loan details, it has the FHA signifier, it's got your upfront MIP. All the goodies for this loan would be saved in a product template. So if you haven't saved those, certainly save it as a template here. It's just like saving the fee template. You're just going to call it what you want to, hit OK, and then that will be available from here on out. Now I'm going to add one more product. Now if I'm showing an FHA 3.5% down, my next best option if for low down payments is probably going to be a conventional 5% down. So I will type conventional 5% down. Now to avoid doing all the same legwork we just did, you could certainly copy the FHA loan and then just change it around as needed. Uh, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to use the copy from button. And I'm going to copy that FHA 3.5% down and hit OK. Now at this point, I want to change this toggle. This is no longer going to be an FHA loan, so I'm going to change it over to no. I'm going to change my down payment percentage to 5%. And I'll change my rate accordingly. Maybe I can get just a slightly higher rate on the conventional. 
And then if I needed to make any modifications to my, my closing costs, I would need to go inside the closing cost details. So if there was any fees that were extra for the FHA loan that were not necessary for the conventional or vice versa, you can certainly make the edits needed here. Now you notice because I unchecked that FHA box, we're not getting an upfront MIP line down here. That's good because we don't want it in there. Now because I used the copy button, it copied over my hazard and taxes, but I do need to modify my MI because this is going to be conventional. I'm not going to be responsible for this 1.35 factor. And you want to check your guidelines, but generally you're going to be somewhere around 0.9 to 1.1. And for conventionals, remember, we do want that 78% cutoff. We do not want it to recalculate every year based on the balance. And we don't have a minimum number of months. So what we're telling Edge is this 142.50, they're going to be responsible for this every month until they hit the 78% mark. And this, this dollar figure does not change over time like an FHA does. Now, if for this loan, maybe I'm not required to collect the premium, I'm going to uncheck that box. And if I go back, we'll see in the closing cost details, the premium line has been zeroed out. Now, that copy, that copy function makes things a world easier. So get used to using that. It, it definitely speeds things up quite a bit. You saw that my data entry on the FHA loan probably took you know five to seven minutes. Uh, but on the conventional, it took less than 30 seconds. I really didn't have a whole lot of data entry to, to manipulate. Now let's add one more option. Now we've, we've shown them two options with MI. We've got FHA MI, it's going to decline over the life of the loan. We've got conventional with MI, that's, that's going to stay static until 78%. Um, what if we wanted to show a single premium or maybe even a lender paid MI option? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show 5% lender paid MI. And I'm going to use that copy button. And this time I'm going to copy the conventional because it's going to be almost identical to this. The difference is I'm going to build that MI into the rate. So I'm going to boost that up to 5%. And then when I get to the mortgage insurance on the end, I'm literally just going to zero this out. Now let's add one more product. The final product is going to be an 80-10-10. Now, 80-10-10s can be a little tricky, so uh, I'm going to show you how to do it real quick. But I am going to use that conventional to copy from, so I don't have to redo all the fees and such. So I will use copy from, and I'll copy the conventional 5%. Now, here's where the 80-10-10 gets a little bit tricky. We need to tell Edge what this first lien is supposed to represent. Now the first lien is technically going to be 80%. So we need 20 right here. So we're, we're telling Edge that it's a 20%, well, it's a $160,000 loan. So it's an 80% loan-to-value loan for this lien. Now we are going to knock this down by adding a second lien. So you kind of want to make a mental note of what this figure is because you know that half of that figure is going to be your 10%. So my second lien is going to be $20,000. Now in this case, let's say maybe I, I can still get that 4.625. I don't need to modify anything in my fees here. Um, unless you've got an additional fee for carrying the second, then you would want to put it in there. And then I've got my hazard insurance property taxes, but I'm going to get rid of my mortgage insurance because there's not going to be any MI. And you can see if I look to the right here, my current LTV is at 80% because I haven't added that second lien yet. But I am going to add a second lien. And in order to do that, you want to check this radio button down at the very bottom. Does this product include a second? Yes, it does. Now it's going to ask you for some brief details on the second. This is not a refi. It's not an existing second. So we're going to leave those alone. And we're going to put in our 20 grand. And let's say for this, uh, this second, we can get I don't know, 4.875. And if this was a purchase money HELOC, it's probably going to have a 300-month term, and it'll be I.O. for the entire term. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do HELOCs. You can certainly get really granular and start showing adjustments for the HELOCs, future adjustments. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to prognosticate over that. I mean, you guys all know Prime has stayed pretty solid for quite a while. And if your index is based on Prime, it's it's pretty much going to act like a fixed loan for the next 10 years or so. Uh, but you know, if, in, in the interest of full disclosure, if you want your client to, to be aware that 
you know, the prime rate can change. It could potentially go up, could potentially go down. It's still going to be a very minor adjustment no matter what. We, we've never seen prime swing, at least since kind of the 80s. We haven't seen prime swing really high up. So uh, we're, we're looking at probably a pretty stable loan here. So I would, I would recommend, just in the interest of saving time, I would probably make this a fixed loan and then I would speak to it on the video and let the client know that, hey, that second is actually an adjustable mortgage. It is based on prime, but let me show you a graphic of what prime has done over time. It's really not going to change much. We don't anticipate it changing any time in the near future, but it is a line of credit. So I want to make you aware of that. So I've got all the details I need for my second in there. And if there was costs that were associated specifically with the second, you could enter them right here. You could also enter them in the detail on that first. It's completely up to you. It's just how you want them to be viewed. But you can tell you did your 801010 right when you see a CLTV of 90% over here in the end. Now remember, this is a low down payment borrower, and we're looking at 5% options here. So the reason I showed you an 801010 first is because that's the most common one. But what if you wanted to do a you know, 80, 15, 5 or something like that. So if I know that my second lien needs to be 15%, I know that my second lien has to be $30,000. So what I would do, and let me rename this first so it doesn't cause confusion. When I get to my second lien, I'm simply just going to replace this loan amount with 30,000, and you know you've done that one right when your CLTV looks like 95%. So there's a little bit of, uh, it, it doesn't automatically calculate this figure for you, so that's probably the hardest part of doing uh, you know, an 801010, 8015, is that you need to know what this figure is. And it, generally you can, you can see it when you're using really round numbers like I am, it's pretty easy to, to figure out, but you can certainly always just manipulate this. If you wanted to find out what 15% is, put in 15%, you know that it's $30,000. So you can use that to, to figure it out if you need to. Oops. All right, so let me just check and make sure I removed my mortgage insurance from this 8015.5. I did not, so I'll need to do that. All right, so let's check it out and see what we've got. Now you may have noticed, uh, I, I've done this a few times, so there's a reason I chose them in the order I did. And the, the idea behind this is I really like this whole cascading effect when I'm presenting to a borrower. I want to show them, you know, we as originators, we, we, we need to be very careful about steering. We don't want to steer anybody. However, you know, for presentational purposes, I like showing them their options in an order they can digest. You know, it makes sense to look at it this way. If they're all over the map, you know, I'm kind of jumping between them. So this, this makes a very, very easy to understand presentation. Now, one thing you can't do inside Edge is you can't move the products around. You can certainly use the copy button to copy one product over another and keep copying until you get the, the order you like. Uh, but you kind of want to have an order in mind when you're doing these types of things, especially if you're showing four, four options. If you're only showing three, you've got an extra option that you can use as a copy slot, so you can move them around at will. Uh, Sean has a question. He says, uh, what would you use the notes section on the side for? Can you give an example? Yeah, absolutely. So these notes, these are only for your eyes. They don't show up anywhere on your presentation. These are literally, when you're, when you're in Edge and you're using this as an as an application program. Basically, you've got the client on the phone and you're literally asking them these questions. As you're going through it, you know, you're, you're, you're asking them things like how much should they make. You're asking them about their goals. You know, maybe one of their goals is 10th uh, um, grade child going to college in three years. You know, little notes that, that you need to, to be able to kind of pick up the conversation with your borrower when you come back. Things that you might not always remember every time you're talking to them. And they may not be terribly important to the loan process, but they're really important to the borrower. If they've, if they've taken the time to tell you, it's important to them. So it's certainly something that you want to keep track of. Uh, but th this is an example of one of the notes. Uh, maybe you want to uh, say you know, where they graduated. They told you that. Um, and maybe you want to make notes about uh, a credit item, you know, um, negative. Uh, credit item that needs to be repaired. 
So these are all just for you. And the good part about this sticky note sheet is it, it follows you through. So you see that it doesn't, doesn't change. It's one sticky note sheet that when you've got a bunch of text in here, it will actually give you a scroll bar. So you can put quite a bit in here. But this does follow you through the presentation. And you can see on the products, you're still looking at these notes. So as you're, as you're formulating what kind of products you want to offer for your borrower, these notes can be very helpful. Uh, you can see that right here, we've got everything we need to pick out a loan product for them. We know, well, if I had entered their, their income, I would know what their DTI is. Um, if I had entered their, their, their debts, I would have actually both ratios for DTI. I would have, have housing in total. Um, but I've got their LTVs, so I know what they can qualify for. I've got my notes that talk about you know, whatever I've collected. And then I've got information in my affordability section on what they can afford. So I've already got my price range down. But generally, you're just using this exactly what, you, what it looks like. It's a yellow pad. You're just using it to keep notes for yourself. All right, so back to the analysis summary screen. Now, when we get here, we're pretty much done with this presentation. I mean, we don't have to do a whole lot of legwork. Now it's time to manipulate it. You know, what, what do we want to show here? What are, based on our borrower's goals, and again, this is a marketing presentation, so we didn't collect goals. We didn't collect affordability information. Um, but had you been speaking to an individual borrower, you'd want to tailor the, the time lengths of your, of your, you know, your analyses in terms of what their goals were. So, for instance, if my borrower said, hey, I'm buying this house, but I anticipate uh, I'm not going to keep it for more than five years, and I'm, pr I'm probably going to end up selling it at that point and trying to move up, well, that's great. That means my five-year point here is perfect because that's exactly what I want to show them for the short term. And long term, if they're not going to stay in the house for more than five years, I'd probably make this five years as well, just so I can show them exactly what that interest in MI paid over time looks like. Now you have benchmarks that you can change. Now usually you're going to use these for refinance transactions, um, but what, what happens here is there's always going to be one product in your graphs on the top right and bottom left that don't have a graph on them. They don't have a, a column. And the reason is that's the highest cost uh, as, a, as a comparison between these four programs. That FHA has the highest pity payment. So all these other ones are showing comparisons against the FHA. This is effectively the benchmark. Now normally, you don't need to change these benchmarks, but I will tell you if you're doing a refinance transaction and say it's a cash out or maybe you're doing a refi from a 30 to a 15, anything that's going to show a higher payment on the new program that you're offering, you probably want to choose the current mortgage as the benchmark. And what will happen is it will actually kind of turn these graphs upside down. So you can see I chose the conventional. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the graphs will look like. But if I was doing a 30 versus a 15, I don't want to show a, a savings on the current mortgage, which is what would show. Instead, I want to benchmark it against the current mortgage, so my 15-year note is actually going to show a negative savings because it's going to cost a little bit more. But for this, this situation, we can certainly just leave it at the default, so these look perfect. And then as we go down to the bottom here, we've already selected a five-year area, but you should really understand what this is comparing. This short-term interest savings, this is not just the interest. This is actually a little bit more detailed. And I'm actually going to explain that a little bit more when we get to our, our final output presentation because I need you guys to know how to drive your customer through understanding that. Now, you have three different options down at the bottom here in terms of what you want to show. It is going to default at total interest in MI paid. We think that's probably the most valuable metric, but you know, based on your client's goals, there may be different goals here. There may be total net worth. Maybe you're showing a, a reinvestment strategy or you're showing how they can uh, you know, put, put money into uh, uh, I don't know, a portfolio that their, your financial planner is offering. You know, there's a number of different reasons why you might want to show net worth. Um, if the borrower is specifically concerned about paying down the mortgage as much as possible, show them how much principal that they can pay for each one of these uh, mortgages over that five years. I'm going to leave it on total interest in MI. But I do want to drive you, I want to bring your attention to this Adjust Reinvestment Strategy button. If you've never been in here, take a moment and check it out when you get the chance. This allows you to show reinvestments of principal every month reinvestments into their current savings account if you've got their affordability sections set up or investments into a new vehicle, say, you know, a, a money market or, you know, a, a portfolio of funds that your, your financial planner is offering. Now, the reason this is important is because, one, this screen has some great detail on it that you should be aware of, things like the MI cutoff month. This is actually the true cutoff for each one of these. And you can see, in this case, I actually have an MI cutoff here, so I, I need to go back and remove that MI if it's still there. But uh, you can see where your cutoff months are going down. That conventional is going to cut off at 113. 
the 5% lender paid MI would cut off at 118, but there's no there's no MI on, on either one of these. So these ones technically, there's just zero MI. This is just telling you where that 78% mark would be attained. And then uh, you've got things like the loan balance at, at the 15 year point. You know, you've got uh, the cash to close shows you for each one of these options. So the reason it shows it right here is because if we filled this out in full and we actually asked our borrower for uh, how much he's got in his savings account, what it's going to do is it's going to subtract the cash to close from what he's got in the savings and it's going to do a new adjusted savings start and that's after the loan closes so that you can continue building wealth on that if you wanted to. I won't go into too much detail on that screen for right now because as a, as a marketing presentation we're probably not going to really show much of a reinvestment but the one thing we may want to do is because there is a pretty marked disparity between these payments we might want to do something like on this 8015.5 use that monetary savings per month to pay down that second so if we want to do that we will go straight over here and we know that we're saving 266 so we're going to put our 266 right there into the second and you can see that that now reduces the freedom point on the second lien to 7.83 years. So that's going to that's gonna pay down that second pretty quickly. And then all they're responsible for is the first after that point. And you can certainly do it with this one too. Take that 190 that you're saving them and put it straight back into principal every month. You can see that uh, that actually significantly reduces the loan balance. And on this one, you're saving them 91. So you can certainly put that in there as well. Now the next step is contact information. This is a marketing presentation, so I'm, I'm really not going to put anything in here. Um, it, the, the property address isn't even going to show on the presentation, so I'm going to leave this completely blank. Final step, choose what you're going to show them. We're going to show them a total cost analysis. That's going to be the one you're going to choose 99% of the time. Now you have options to show or hide the different uh, loan products that you've got in your presentation. So if your borrower comes back to you and says, you know what, that FHA is just way too expensive, I don't even want to see it, um, you can uncheck this box here, and then only these three products will show on your presentation. And you can always do this later, too. You certainly don't have to make the choice right now and have it stick. It's, uh, you can always come back into the screen and check or uncheck as you see fit. Now payment notes, I see a lot of people skipping these, but I can't stress how important these are. Payment notes, and you, you guys can all read this part on your own, but there's, there's asterisks that are tied to them when you use payment notes, and there's similar asterisks right next to the payment. So for compliance, you got to let your client know if this is a pity payment or if it's just a P&I payment. Uh, there may be other items that you want to discuss that are related to compliance on that payment, um, but I would tell you payment includes taxes, insurance, and MI when applicable something like that. It just, it's just going to protect you later down the line so there's no confusion about this. Now this part takes you through the individual screens. Remember we had a four quadrant uh, uh, look in the analysis summary screen. Uh, each of those quadrants is broken out in the following screens. So if you wanted to you could change you know, the analysis mod so you could, add, um, you could add additional verbiage about what the section describes. This is actually, I would recommend that you use this. And it's not defaulted in your program, but you certainly can. Um, let me chat this to all of you. So feel free to copy that and just put it on a, on a sticky note or something. Um, the reason I, I tell you this is because one of the probably the most confusing thing about presenting to a borrower is you're an originator and you know mortgages. Your borrower does not. So the idea behind presenting loan options to them is you know, you've got a choice of whether you want to be the originator that's just quoting a rate and a payment or if you want to be the originator that is showing them all the long-term details of the loan and really isolating down what are the true costs of doing a mortgage. Now you, you already do that. We're giving you a way to do it in the graphic format. So I would, I would encourage all of you, you know, read this little blurb here and understand it and really put it in action when you're when you're doing your presentations to the client. This is going to be a very important metric to be able to show them because no one else out there is going to do this. Now I'll drill down that a little bit more when we get to our final presentation. But we've got the long-term section where we could certainly change the metric if we wanted to. We could change the analysis years. I'm going to leave them alone for now. And now we get to the end. Now at the end I will tell you choose the email link. 
And the reason is this is the one that's dynamic. It changes every time you update something. It's going to it's going to update for your borrower. Uh, this is the one you can include a video on. This is the one that gives you alerts when the borrower has viewed it. You can't get that with print and PDF. And we understand that there's some cases where you're going to have to print it, or you're going to have to send a PDF out because your borrower lives under a rock. You know, if a case like that, totally understand. You got to do what you got to do. But I would tell you, really push for the email link. It, it's very important because it can be updated and it's trackable. That's, that's probably the most critical part. You don't want to be caught in the middle of a telephone game you, you can't control. So if you've talked to you know, borrower one and you've, you've explained this, this mortgage proposal and, oh, yeah, they totally understand. They're, they're ready to go. They, they just need to talk to a couple more people in their family because there's more decision makers in the process. Now they're going to take that print job that you gave them and they're going to try and relay your advice to a second person. And it's not going to happen the way you want it to. That is the scariest thing that can happen because now you've got misinformation going across the board and somebody down the line in that conversation is going to say, are you kidding? That doesn't make any sense. And now it's going to be passed back through the telephone game. When you use an email link and you include a video, there, there's no disputing what your advice is. It's there. It's on the presentation. So I highly encourage you, even if you're a little camera shy, you know, do an audio in an audio only if you want to, but certainly make sure there's some advice that, that accompanies your presentation. Otherwise, you're, you're at risk of other people trying to explain what advice you gave, and it's never a good thing. All right, so a couple of check boxes here that you have available for you. One is to get notified when the presentation is viewed. That's going to send you that email alert, and it's going to send you a rate watch alert that lets you know, you know, Joe Borrower clicked on your presentation, you watched it for five minutes. Um, and, of course, when you get that alert, it's probably time to call the borrower while the information is still fresh in his mind. You have the call button. Um, I'm going to leave this unchecked for today's presentation, but what this is, it puts a little button on the top of your presentation that just says, call me now. And it allows you to connect your two phones via the Internet. Um, by default, you all have three call credits. If you run out of call credits, you can purchase more. There's 20 bucks for 20 credits. Um, give them a shot. See if you like them. See if it's useful for your business structure. If it's not, just uncheck the box here. You, don't, you certainly don't have to buy these. Um, and you know your number's plastered all over your presentation. And when they're viewing it on mobile, they can even tap on your number and it'll call you. So I would say that this feature is kind of not as important as, as it used to be before we had the mobile apps. Now this one here, send edge view alert to the partner. This was the whole reason in the beginning I told you guys to enter a partner email address in that first screen. If we didn't have a partner email address, this checkbox wouldn't even appear. But this is this is actually great for when you're working with your you know real estate partners, financial planners. You want to keep them in the loop on what your borrower's consuming. You know, they're gonna get an alert that says Joe Borrower viewed this presentation, but it's gonna have a link to that presentation so they'll be able to see what you've sent them. And I always, I always recommend you preface your borrower with that. When you're, when you're initially telling them about your value proposition, part of it is that, you know, I'm working with realtor, I'm working with financial planner X, and we're working to help you get, you know, not, not only the best return off of your loan, but we want, we want you to make the best long-term decision for yourself. So I'm going to include him, I'm going to keep him in the loop as we go through these presentations so he knows where you're at. And we can both be, you know, saying the same thing and, and telling the same story. And I, most borrowers will really appreciate that. Now, you might run across one or two that say, you know what, I uh, kind of like this to just stay between you and I. I really don't want my realtor knowing about it. Uh, I just want him to show me the houses. And that's okay. But that's why you make it part of your initial value proposition so you can understand what your client's needs are when you're first talking to them. All right, next step, choose a quote date. For compliance, anytime you publish a rate, you need to have a quote date on it. You do not want your borrower to come back to you later on down the line and say, hey, you quoted me 3.5%. Where the heck is that rate? Well, Mr. Borrower, I quoted you 3.5% six months ago when the rates were at that point. That's the reason I have a quote date on my presentations. So I'm going to select today's date, and then I'm going to hit Generate Link. Now what this does is this reaches out to our server, and it, it looks for your presentation and then generates a short link that you can send to your borrower. So at this point, I would copy that link, and I would probably just paste it into an email and just kind of get ready to be able to send that out to my borrower. But I'm not going to send it just yet. Remember, I stressed how important it was to do video. At this point, I'm going to hit Add Audio Video. Now, before I get into the actual video part, I promised you I'd give you a more uh, drill down on uh, the savings over 60 months area. If you hit the More Info section, you'll see that it breaks down 
you know, what these totals are all the way across the board for each one of these loan programs. Now, the parts that we're comparing are really just these bottom ones. We're taking the total interest and in MI that they're paying, we're subtracting out the tax benefit that they would get over that time period, and then we're adding in closing in points. This does not include the prepaid reserves. We don't believe those are a cost of doing the loan, so we don't include those here. So we start with interest and in MI, subtract tax benefit, add the closing in points, and we come up with a total cost for this loan over the five-year period of time. And you may have noticed that I didn't mention anything about principal. The reason is, when they're paying principal, they're retaining that in the form of equity. So we don't view this as a cost of the loan. The true cost of the loan are the ones they cannot get back. Those are interest in MI, those are closing costs. They do reap a benefit off the tax benefit, so that is subtracted from those figures. But when we take a look at all three of those across the board, and we look at these totals that we get at the bottom, we compare those against each other. That's what your savings is when you're looking at the short term. This is not your monthly savings multiplied by 60. This is a far different calculation. So you, you need to be aware of how to explain this to your borrower. And that little blurb I gave you in, uh, in the notes section should be immensely helpful. <laughs> All right, so now let's get into video. And we've got about seven minutes left here, so this is actually going to be perfect timing, I think. Um, what you'd want to do first is, first thing, eyeball your report. See what's on there, you know, see what it's showing, see what you want to draw attention to. So in this case, I'm going to clear out all my, all my highlighting real quick here. And I'm going to draw attention to things like the reduction payment. I set extra principal payment every month. I'm probably going to highlight the pity payments. And then I might highlight the cash to close. So the borrower can see that these are relatively, I mean, the FHA is a little less cash to close, but they're relatively the same across the board. Now, knowing that those are the figures that I want my client to see, I'm going to leave those highlighted. And actually, before I move on, John has a question. He says, why aren't closing in points in separate fields? I always get clients uh, saying no points, but hard to discuss with this presentation. So they actually are broken out in another area. Uh, the reason we don't break them out separately in this area is because they, they are one cost for us. However, they are broken out up in the more info sections. So if we look up here and go into closing costs, you can see that points are actually a separate area. And then we've got the breakdown of, of what each total is here. So the prepaids are outside. Uh, and certainly you could show them the fee detail as well. Um, you can see exactly you know, what the prepaid interest amounts are. It, it does break it down in, in total, but I would tell you, John, for the area that we were talking about down here, the, we, we do them as a lump sum just so it's easier to calculate. Uh, but certainly they are broken out up in this more info section up top. Uh, Myra's question, uh, in the 8015-5, how do you explain the blended rate to the borrower? Oh, great question. So a blended rate, you're right, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to try and explain, but basically what it is is we take the two liens and we use the weight of the lien. So, so for instance, the first lien being 80% is going to carry a majority of the weight. The second lien, it's a little bit higher rate, uh, but it's got far less weight. So what we do is we take those figures and there's a calculation behind it, but what it ends up showing is this rate is a cumulative rate for both liens. So the majority of, of this total, this 190 total, is that 80% note. And that 80% note, as we saw earlier, okay, let's go back into the breakdown here. Actually, we can look at it right here. But the 80% is 4.625, whereas the 15% is 4.8. So you can see that our blended rate is just between those, but it's not much over that 4.625 because this first lien carries more weight than the second. So what I, what I would tell my borrower if I was trying to explain a blended rate to them is one, I would point out this section and I would show them that there's two rates here. Now in order to be able to show you an accurate comparison between programs that have two liens and programs that only have one, we've taken those two liens, we've blended them together, and we've blended the rates together using the weight of the liens. So remember our first lien is 4.625, our blended rate here, 4.664, still not much higher than, than that first lien. So this is generally showing that, hey, you're, you, you can't rely on just the first lien rate. It is a little tiny bit higher because of that second lien, but it's really not much because that second lien doesn't weigh very much. I hope that helps. I'll see if I can get you a little bit more detailed explanation, Myra. If you would uh, send us a note over at supportmortgagecoach.com and I will see if I can get you a, a full calculation for that, just in case you ever need it. All right, so let's get back over to video real quick here. 
If you've never set up your video before, first time you come into this screen, you want to right click on the presentation, and this can be anywhere on the presentation, hit settings, and then you're just going to select your microphone and your webcam. Now, if you've got a built-in mic, you're probably going to see, you can see I've got a bunch of them on mine here. Uh, if you've got a built-in mic on a laptop, you might find one called Microphone Array. Now, as long as you're using a laptop open, that works great. But if you're docking it and you've got it closed on a docking station, you probably don't want to use that mic because it's under a closed lid and you're going to get a huge, weird reverb on it. So um, in a case like that where you're docking your, your laptop, I would say just get an external webcam that has a mic on it. That really, it, it really does help to you know, just separate everything out so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, in this case, I do have an external webcam. I, my, my laptop is docked, so uh, I'm using this LifeCam VX2000. And if you don't have a webcam and you're looking to find one, get the cheapest one you can find. You really don't need to have a super duper mic. I know that there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, you know, originators needing to have this huge video presence, go out and buy a Logitech 9000 camera. It's going to cost you $150, but it's going to make you a star. <laughs> I will tell you that's completely wrong. Okay, Your best bet here is get a cheapy camera. Get, get one that, just make sure it's got a microphone on it, but it really shouldn't cost you over $30. Um, it doesn't even have to be HD. In fact, the ones that don't have HD tend to stream a lot better. Remember, this is an online presentation and you're using streaming video. So you want to make sure that your video is as small and portable as possible so that your borrower experience is good. If you've got one of those super duper high def uh, cameras and mics, you know, using a Yeti mic and a Logitech 9000, you're only going to be able to get about two minutes worth of recording time in there because the file size is going to be too big, and it's not going to be very portable. If your borrower is on a bad connection, they're going to get hiccups in your video, and all the money you spent on that super duper webcam goes out the door. So get a cheapie. I really do recommend these life cams. They're I, I want to say I've got mine for 18 bucks, and uh, I'll show you in just a second. But uh, it tends to work out really nicely. And once you've got your your setup going. You're just going to hit record message, and there's me, everybody. Hi, everybody. And you can see that it, you know, I'm using a, a dirt cheap camera. Picture's nice. You know, it doesn't have to be production quality. Remember, this is just going to get passed around. They're going to be viewing this this video uh, not only on their on their computers, but they're going to view it on mobile too. So you got to consider what their data packages look like on their mobile. And if you've got a super duper video, too big, it's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to take more data. So protect your client a little bit. Use a small video stream, and uh, it'll it'll function a lot faster for them when they pull it up. All right, so some tips on recording. One of them is this record button right here. This, this can start and stop the recording. So what I would recommend is hover your mouse on it and then hit the record button when you're ready and then don't touch your mouse again until you're done. That way you don't have to look away from the camera to try and find that button again. All you have to do is tap it again on your mouse because your mouse didn't move. Um, that's the number one tip. Number two tip, eye contact is very important. If, if you don't see my eyes, I'm not talking to you. If I'm looking at the screen like this and talking, you know, if you're my borrower, what are you thinking? Guy doesn't know, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's reading a script. Why, why am I listening to this? You don't need that. So I would tell you, take a little sticky pad, just like the one you had an edge there. Take a little sticky note, put it right up behind your camera and write your bullet points of what you need to talk about. You know, no more than four or five bullet points, but uh, most important parts of actually composing your video, one, you want to introduce yourself, you know, talk about who you are if you've never talked to this client. Keep it short, though. Uh, two, you want to talk about, you know, whatever realtor partner you might be working with. You want to make sure, honor the realtor when you're doing this so that uh, when it does get passed through them, they can see that. And, you know, that, that always comes back returned, so uh, that, that always helps. Uh, three, be very cursory about the loan options. Don't, don't talk too long about them. Uh, they're the most boring part of this presentation, honestly, is the loan options. So the most important part is what you're selling, the relationship, the education to your borrower. And you want to keep this video under about two minutes because after two minutes you kind of start losing attention. So keep it real light on the options. You know, you may want to discuss bringing a goal that they've discussed with you on the phone and relate it to one of the options. That's always very helpful. Um, but then make sure there's a solid close to uh, so, solid call to action at the close. If, uh, if you leave it open with a question, generally they're not going to get back to you with the answer to that question. However, if you tell them something like, I know you're going to have a lot of questions after you finish watching this, 
please call me as soon as you can so that we can discuss all your options and make sure you have the education needed to make a quality mortgage decision. You know, don't use my words, but something into, along those lines. But don't leave it up in the air. You want to make sure there's a call to action at the end. And then when you're done recording, all you're going to do is simply hit that record button again, and it's going to stop your presentation. And this link back inside Edge would now have your video on it. So you literally just copy this, paste it into an email to your client, compose a nice email message around it. And actually, if you want some tips on uh, email messaging, check out our YouTube page. Uh, Dave just published a, a video in there. Let's see if I can find it for you. Go to my channel. And let's go to video manager. And I'm actually gonna I'm gonna shoot you guys this link real quick here. Um, there we go. How to write an effective mortgage coach email. So you can always search our page for this, like I did. Just search email when you go to youtube.com forward slash mortgage coach. Um, you can search for email and it'll pull this one up for you. But I'm also going to chat this to all of you real quick. Okay, so that link should now be in your chat box there. Go ahead and click on it so it opens up uh, a tab so that you can watch it when you get off this presentation. Um, but that, that will be incredibly useful in composing your emails. Uh, John's question, is it, is it preferred to use a separate webcam versus the laptop so that I can put it lower where my eyes are versus the top of the screen? You know, John, it's actually kind of up to you. I, I like having it a little bit above my head. And the only reason I say that is... And there's a couple of reasons. One, there's a reason I wear a hat. I'm losing hair on the top of my head. So I like to look up at the camera. Uh, if you've ever watched anybody take a selfie, they do it above their head. And there's a reason for that. Um, but it also gives this uh, a different approach. See, if you're eye level, that's perfect. You never want the camera to be below your eyes. That's one thing I would tell you, because now you're looking down at your borrower. That is not a good feeling. So I would tell you, at eye level is great or above eye level is fine too. Um, looking up at the borrower actually kind of gives you a little bit of kind of a background diminutive pose. Um, even if it's not intended, it's not a bad thing. It, uh, it tends to make people feel a little bit more empowered. Uh, they're, they're looking down to you to get this information. But that's all, that's all psychology in theory. So I would tell you, John, if you, uh, if, I would definitely recommend getting a separate one from the one on the laptop just so you can move it around at will. Um, but try and keep it at eye level or above. Never, never go below, and you should be in good shape there. All right, so with that said, I think I'm going to go ahead and close out the call. Thanks for the great questions today, and uh, please do join us next week for our Thursday training session. And if you've got other items that you'd like to have addressed, have those ready for me or, or for Lori if she uh, ends up doing the call, and we'll certainly get them ready for you. All right, so with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.